Okay, I'm gonna be a bit honest. Choosing the right lights can be a bit daunting. There's all these different types of lights and different use cases, pros and cons. And there's new lights coming out all the time. How do you know which one to choose? It can be overwhelming. So if you need a little bit of a crash course into types of lights and, and how they're used and effective use cases, I've got you covered. Let's get started. Well, what better place to start than the beginning? Thanks to Prometheus, we have fire. Now, fire's kind of cool. It's got a certain aesthetic to it, a certain feel, and it kind of dances around. The only problem is it's really hard to control and maintain, and it's uh, quite dangerous. Fire is a really unique and warm color temperature that most lights can't replicate, of between about 1500 and 2000. It does have a really cool aesthetic, a unique color temperature, and the effects of it are really hard to match with modern day lights. But it can be rather dangerous and really difficult to maintain. If you're thinking about using a campfire or a lantern, sometimes those go out unexpectedly and can really stall your shoot. Another downside is fire doesn't provide a lot of light. And if you want a lot of light, you have to have a lot of fire. If you really wanna use fire on your next shoot, be very careful and plan accordingly. If we're gonna go next in line according to age, we're gonna talk about tungsten lights. Now, tungsten lights have been used to make movies ever since movies were being made. They're a super iconic light that anyone can recognize. They're even used in Animal Crossing as movie-making lights. This light right here is a classic tungsten light. Specifically, it's an RE650. Now, this light has been used for decades to make films. And actually, I use this in film school, learning how to make movies. And you can see the chassis and the body style is super iconic and is used in a lot of different lights nowadays that are super modern. While these lights are kind of ancient, especially in technology terms, they still have a lot of redeeming qualities. For one, now, these can be found for pretty cheap. Two, they are sturdy and rugged. A lot of these are made out of complete metal and steel and can be repaired fairly easily. You can access all of the parts just by opening up a latch or two. Another benefit is when you turn these on, they are at full brightness straight off the bat. A lot of tungsten lights have built-in Fresnel lenses. These Fresnel lenses allow it to focus the light more efficiently and you can change the quality of the light from flood to spot, to vary how the light spreads across your subject. Lastly, the color temperatures across tungsten lights is super accurate and about 3200 Kelvin. The quality of the light is also very hard, but can be softened with, you know, soft boxes or any modifiers in front of it. The main downside of a tungsten light is these get hot. After just a couple minutes of running a tungsten light, you will burn yourself by just touching the body of the light. Not only is this a little dangerous if you're not wearing gloves or not paying attention to a light on around you, it will increase the temperature of the set that you're shooting on. If you're in a small room and you're running tungst tungsten lights, you'll wanna turn on the AC as soon as the director yells cut. I can't imagine shooting with these in the summer. And at the end of the day, when you're ready to go home and break down the set, you're gonna have to wait 15 to 20 minutes after these lights have been turned off in order to handle them properly. As if that wasn't enough cons with using tungsten lights. Additionally, if you're needing to change the bulbs on these lights, you have to be very careful as they are super sensitive to the oils on your hands and can really impact the bulb and actually make it completely inoperable if you handle it incorrectly. Lastly, these lights do not turn off as soon as you turn them off from the switch. Being that they're actual light bulbs, like were used a hundred years ago, when you turn these off, they have a cool down period and can often leave a little bit of light showing even seconds after it's been turned off. And during that time period, you shouldn't really move the light around a lot because that is actually quite fragile and dangerous to the bulb. 
The only way I really recommend these lights is if you're going for a retro kind of style, if you want to shoot on old equipment to see what it looks like, or maybe you just don't have the budget for it and these are rather cheap from your rental house. Or maybe they're just at your disposal and you have access to them rather easily. Then yeah, I'll go for it, but as we're gonna talk later on, there's a lot of newer, more modern lights that are a lot easier to use and don't have any of the downfalls that these tungsten lights have. Next up, closely related to the tungsten light is the HMI, the hydrargyrium, hy it's really difficult to say. Hydrargyrium. Hydrargyrium medium mark iodide. Let's, uh, let's just stick to HMI. HMIs can look a lot like tungsten lights, but they differ quite a bit. HMIs are much larger than their tungsten counterparts. Here's just a 500 watt HMI right next to the 650 watt tungsten light. As you can see, it's a lot larger. With that size comes power. HMIs are two to three times more powerful than their equivalent wattage tungsten lights. For this reason, they're still used a lot in the industry. You really just can't match the raw output that HMIs can deliver. HMIs come right out of the box, hitting that daylight color temperature. So a lot of the time, these are used to mimic sunlight through windows or even to counteract or supplement sunlight when shooting outdoors. While there's a lot of differences between HMI and tungsten lights as far as advantages are concerned, the cons are actually quite similar in some areas. These lights also get incredibly hot and you may even need thicker gloves than the ones you would be using on your tungsten lights while handling HMI lights. These lights are quite fragile as well. If you have them on, I would not move them. The lamps in the interior bulbs of these lights are quite fragile, especially when heated. In contrast to their tungsten counterparts, HMIs can actually be quite expensive and run to a few thousand dollars even for a low power model. Additionally, where tungsten lights are typically just plug and play and you can flip them on in a matter of seconds, HMIs require a huge, heavy ballast box to power the light. Now don't get me wrong, these lights come with a lot of caveats and downsides, but they're used to this day in the industry for a reason. They output just a ton of light. And if you need a lot of light on set, there's only one way to get it, and that's through an HMI. Now we move on to every office and supermarket's favorite light, fluorescent lights. Fluorescent lights came into popularity for a few reasons. One, they're super efficient, especially when you compare those to tungsten lights that were used just before that. A 650 watt tungsten could be matched with a much, much lower 100 or even 60 watt bulb of a fluorescent light. Because they weren't using so much wattage in comparison to a tungsten light, they ran a lot cooler and didn't heat up your set or the space you were shooting in quite as fast. You could even touch them with your bare hands without burning yourself. Fluorescents differ from tungsten lights in another key area. Because they're tubes and they're often frosted, the light you get straight from the tungsten tubes is often quite soft and sometimes doesn't need any additional diffusion if that's what you're going for. Where tungsten lights are 3200 Kelvin straight out of the box, you could change the bulbs on a fluorescent light to match whatever color temperature you were going for. All you had to do was turn off the light, take one set of bulbs out and put another set of bulbs in, and you could be daylight balanced in only a matter of a minute or two. Fluorescent lights were basically a godsend when they came out. They were cool to the touch, they were highly efficient, and they gave you nice, soft, even light that you were going for, and they were quick to set up and quick to tear down. But that didn't come without a few downsides. First off, I thought they were always a little too large for what they did. The tubes came in a few different variants between two feet, four feet, and sometimes even longer, but that would take up quite a bit of real estate on set. Fluorescent lights are prone to flicker. They have a certain kind of cycle or refresh rate, and if you're shooting an odd frame rate or even high frame rates, that can often introduce flicker into your shot, which you really don't want. Fluorescent lights were a huge improvement over tungsten lights and I valued using them every time I could just to save my hands from burning. And that's why, still to this day, sometimes they're still used on projects. 
They're highly efficient, they've come down quite a bit in price, and people just like the way they look. And last but not least, we have LED lights. Now LED lights stand for light emitting diode, which basically means there's these tiny little chips that when electrical current goes through them, they emit light. And the greatest thing about light emitting diodes or LEDs is their power consumption. Even in comparison to fluorescent lights, LEDs are highly efficient. An LED light of a specific wattage can put out multiple times more light than an equivalent fluorescent or even tungsten light. Due to LED lights low power consumption and high efficiency, these lights also put off a low amount of heat. You don't have to worry about them heating up a room by using them all day. And once you're done, you can easily turn them off and immediately start working the fixture. Being that LEDs are so small and efficient and only consume a small amount of power, that means you can put these LEDs on a bunch of different fixtures, including something as small as something that can fit on your camera. This light is from Aperture and has a bunch of different LEDs in the front panel of it and is powered by a single battery built in. Now the crazy thing about this is that even though this light is so small and tiny and can fit on the top of your camera, it is as powerful as a light made even decades ago. So you can see this is basically blowing out my face even though I'm holding it basically an arm length away. And also because LEDs are so tiny, you can fit multiple different diodes on the front that actually range from various different color temperatures. So even though I have it at a warm tungsten daylight balance as soon as I turn this on, I can easily switch between daylight and tungsten, tungsten with a few click of a buttons. Being able to switch between tungsten and daylight in a single fixture in a matter of seconds is something you can't do on any other type of lights. So if you're trying to really mix lighting or really dial in the right color temperature, you can really do these with LEDs. A lot of LEDs even come in RGB modes where you can flip through different colors, not including just yellow to blue or warm to cold. Any color you can really think of, you can match it with an LED light. I have a few different applications here as examples of different fixtures that use LED lights from a simple one by one color panel to even a roll up mat that has LED lights all over it that can be adhered to your wall or even uh, the top of your car if you're trying to light a car scene. Really the possibilities are endless. Those are a few examples of interesting types of lights that use LED chips, but there are also just standard filmmaking lights that look similar to the tungsten lights we talked about before that use LED chips on board. Now these lights are made to add modifiers or use similar to how you would tungsten lights. The only downside to LED lights is their output can't match something like an HMI, so they'll never really replace something like that on a film set. LED lights really are the future of filmmaking, and we're just now seeing how far they can be pushed. I can't wait to see really what they're gonna look like 10 years from now. Well, that about does it. I hope that gives you some insight to different types of lights, their use cases, pros and cons, and if you're trying to choose the right light for your next scene, it helps clears up any misconceptions you might have. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments, and feel free to follow me on Instagram, and until next time,